Um, I met a lot of you in the past couple days, and I feel close to you. I feel so close to you that I want to tell you a little secret. I have an academic crush on this man. <laughs> Ricky Brule has changed the way that I practice anesthesia. Every single paper that this man writes, I, I cling to. I see what I can glean from. I take something, and I really think that by reading what he's done, I've become a better anesthesiologist, I'm a better teacher, and I really have taken to understanding what we do. So, when my guru, my oracle, tells me that he's performing intraneural injections on a daily basis, I have to take it to heart that this is a reasonable thing for us to be doing. So what I'm going to teach you now, or what I'm going to explain to you is, once I saw that this is what's happening in his world, I sought to understand how it could happen in our world. And this is the knowledge that I'm going to try to impart to you now that the timer is reset. Okay. This seems to be a pretty simple cartoon of a right peripheral nerve. And we see endoneurium, epineurium. We see fascicles surrounded by very dense perineurium inside of them. We see nerves with endoneurium. But we also see an awful lot of other stuff under this endoneurium. And that's stromal and tissue elements. And we can, and we have, and we always probably will be, for with what we know now and the limitations of our ultrasound, be performing intraneural injections in that region. What we can't be doing is performing intraneural injections in a fascicle. So, lest you think that my cartoon is way too simple, I'm going to show you that it really does look just like this micrographic slide, where you can see the epineurium, you see the fascicle surrounded by the perineurium, and you see a heck of a lot of stromal and tissue elements inside a nerve where you can give anesthesia and where you do whether you believe it or not. The first person that described this phenomenon to us was Paul Bigelison. And actually, the first time I met him, I threw my body across the table and stuck my hands around his neck saying, what are you doing? How did you actually get this past your IRB and what were you thinking? He worked in a, um, an ambulatory surgery center where he did base of thumb surgery. He had 26 patients, which took an axillary block is 104 nerves that he could play with. And he did ultrasound-guided axillary blocks using block needles. He tried to find a paresthesia. He tried to elicit a pop. When he did, he uh, put three milliliters of local anesthesia in each nerve. If he didn't, he put three, six cc's outside the nerve and made a halo, or he added another three. So each nerve had about six mLs of local anesthesia. He looked at the onset and the success of his block. He looked at the incidence of his complications both immediately, and he followed all of these patients out to six months. This is what he did. So that's your nerve. That's where he put his needle. And there's that blown up nerve that everybody at workshop yesterday said to me, have you ever done this? Have you ever seen this? So we're all doing it. Okay. What did Paul find? He found that it was pretty hard to do an intraneural injection in the musculocutaneous nerve, but managed to get halo and swelling, paresthesias and dysesthesias in a fair number of his patients. And as I'm going to tell you, all of them had perfect blocks for certain, nobody required general anesthesia. And at six, one you know, post-operatively, and at the six-month period, there were no neurologic injuries. Why does he think this could happen? He's going to tell you that nerves in the axilla have little surrounding fascia. They've got large amounts of stromal tissue around the fascicles. And using a blunt needle to pierce that epineurium might actually force the fascicles away. It actually doesn't encourage fascicular uh, violation. And the nerves are free and, and less constrained and not constrained to swell in those areas. So I'm going to, you just saw these slides uh, a minute ago. Ani showed a test, but I'm going to tell you what happens a little bit when you do inject intraneurally. And Vincent taught us, after he inserted his needles in 28 pig axilla, um, and interestingly, he put his needles under direct visualization. You can see the range of currents that it took to stimulate. He injected dye. And in 24 of 28 of those nerves, he saw that them blow up. He has no evidence of fascicular dysplasia in any of them. And here's the nerve, and here's what you and I see and won't admit to almost every day in our practices. The, ip, uh, the ink ended up in the epineurium. You see all of the fascicles are intact. And again, the axons in the endoneurium in this study were intact. So what happens physiologically when you inject local anesthesia into nerves? 
And I home told, first showed us this many years ago, in 2005. He took rats. One side was the control. The other side, he either injected saline, formalin, or clinically used as doses of ropivacate in. He did walking track analysis, which is basically putting rats on a little track with the uh, ink on their feet and watching the stability of their walking. And he watched these rats out to 67 days. And the rats that had intraneural injections of saline and clinically useful uh, or used doses of ropivacaine did not have any uh, abnormality in their walking track analysis, where you can see the rat that, that did get the formula, and it took 67 days till a return of function. So now you're going to say to me, Meg, that's a tiny little bit of local anesthesia, not even a clinically used amount. What happens when you put a really useful dose in somebody? or in something. And again, this is 10 pigs under general anesthesia with left and right median nerves. One had no intervention. One had a clinically used dose, 20 milliliters of lidocaine with epinephrine placed. Again, with a block tip needle. And a vet examined the, the animals for evidence of sensory, if you can test the pig for sensory, and motor deficits. And on the seventh day, the nerves were excised and examined. And, and this is what you saw. You did see some um, exonal balls and some lipid latent macrophages. So there was evidence of some local anesthesia uh, causing toxicity. But the expansion seen on the ultrasound in clinically relevant volumes causes histological but not functional injury. And, uh, injury. Okay, you're performing local anesthetics intraneurally, whether you admit it or not. In this study, Arbach looked at uh, 10 shoulders and non-preserved cadavers and performed ultrasound-guided interscaling blocks with dye. And then he sectioned the uh, specimens, and he found that half of them had evidence of subepineural ink. None of them had subperineural ink. And what he or those guys feel happens in this is where we're really aiming with our local anesthetic in an interscaling block is to be under the deep cervical fascia. But in, more, in half of the cases done any way you and I would have done it, there was evidence of subepineural ink. Now, what about putting physiologic doses in human beings? Have we seen that? And lately we're beginning to see reports of this occurring. Sal Bench looked at 17 patients for popliteal blocks, and he used nerve stimulation at a tibial response of 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps. Uh, uh, he put pivocaine in there with contrast, and I'll tell you why. He measured the sciatic nerve before and after the injection. He sent these patients downstairs to CT scan to see if there was evidence of dye and air intraneurally. And he was able to follow them for, with nerve conduction studies and physical studies at one and four weeks. And before the block, he measured the, uh, our, the nerves after with evidence of swelling, and he watched the tracking of the local anesthesia proximally and distally. And as in 16 of these patients, there was evidence of local anesthesia intraneurally with dye in the nerve on CT scan and air. And none of these patients at one week or four weeks had any evidence of neural injury. Even more recently, this month or last month, Harrow looked at 325 patients that were having knee arthroscopy and performed ultrasound-guided subgluteal sciatic blocks with video. And he used 20 milliliter volumes, either the patients received mepivacaine or ropivacaine. And the sensory motor blockade was evaluated at 30 minutes. In this group of 325 patients, 16% of them had uh, evidence of intraneural injection on video. And these patients not only had significantly faster onset of blocks, they had no neurologic sequela. And we can see that in the next slide, both in the mepivacaine and the ropivacaine group. The intraneural group are the black ones, and you can see the times to the patients having blockade is statistically significantly faster in all of those that had evidence of intraneural injection. So not only we do, it, do we do it, maybe there are advantages in our busy practices to making our blocks set up more quickly. I can't tell you how to do this, but I know that we really need to be concentrating on this, and that's avoiding high intraneural pressures. In this study, Kapoor looked at uh, 15 dogs, 30 sciatic nerves, and using a long bevel cutting needle, uh, injections were made with an in-line manometer, epineurally, intraneurally, intraneurally, with high and low pressures. And they looked at the reflex abnormalities and the paresis in the, in the canines. And what they saw is that the reflex abnormalities and the 
paresis in the epineural injections really were not any longer than to be expected from the local anesthetics that were injected. But on the high pressure injections, these abnormalities persisted beyond a week. And when they looked in a separate study with the same sort of protocol, they looked at those nerves that were subjected to that high intraneural pressure injection. They found mechanical disruption, delamination, fragmentation of the myelin sheets, and cellular infiltration. Really, really bad things going on. Um, there are devices available that look at injection pressure, but I have yet, and I don't know if anybody in the audience has seen a paper that shows that actually there's a better outcome when they're used. In our own institution, when they changed our 20cc syringes for cost, I had to stop giving general anesthesia because I, it just felt differently to me. The only advice I can tell you is don't inject into something that feels like high pressure for you, and I got the expensive 20 gauge syringes back quickly. The other thing that I can tell you in order to stay safe while you're doing these inevitable interneural inter, uh, blocks is always, always, always to be using block tip needles. Way back in 1977, Dag Salander showed us by stretching rabbit sciatic nerves beyond fixed points and then um, using needles of standard bevel and block bevel, that when you use block needles, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, that the nerve fascicles tend to roll away from the needle point with the shorter bevel needles and really diminish the risk of fascicular injury. And the degree of injury not only was worse with the long bevel needle, but uh, varied with the orientation of the bevel. And I just pulled this out to show you. I mean, this is uh, the difference in the amount of injury that you can have with a cutting needle against the grain. Sala Blanche basically just recently repeated that Doug Salander uh, study, but he used a sciatic nerve that was in situ so that the nerve and the fascicles and everything were freer to move in a way that would be analogous with what we were doing in our clinical, in our clinical practice and compared, again, block tip needles to longer bevel needles. And once he finished it, he sectioned out the sciatic nerve. And he was able to quantify 520 fascicles. 134 were in contact with needle trajectories. In the block tip needle group, there were no fascicular or vascular injuries, although it wasn't statistically significant in this study. The group that did use sharp bevel needles um, did have four fascicles that were damaged and one intraneural uh, vessel violated. So again, I can only, only encourage you, now that you've got ultrasound, don't just cheap out and take the quick needle because you think you can see what you're doing. So I need to really thank my colleague, Ricky Brule, for letting me, leading me to the path to understand that we are doing intraneural injections every day, whether we, we know it or not. The limitations of our ultrasound now still will cause us to, even if we think we're not doing it, have sometimes, as in 16% of those saphitous nerves, uh, sciatic nerves, we will be intraneural whether we want to or not. So what we need to do is really concentrate on how to keep our blocks safe rather than giving up this tool which could speed our onset and make more blocks more successful.